So let's begin. First of all, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, at the beginning of, of the summer uh, and the end of the academic year. Um, today is one of the um, short, relatively short, strategically oriented uh, events that the IMLR is organizing. And what we've done is that we've divided the session into two. In the first session, we're going to hear uh, the HRC Future of Language Research Fellows uh, give a brief report. And in the second part of the session, we're going to uh, relaunch the journal, the policy journal, Language, Society and Policy. And we're going to get straight down to business. We're very much in debt to the three fellows, Emmanuel Labo, Michelle McLeod and Nicola McLennan, for taking on this role on the benefit, for the benefit of the subject area, canvassing everyone in the subject area, compiling a report, feeding back to the AHRC, and really helping to define where the Research Council is going to be spending its money over a number of years to come. What they're going to, well, they presented their, their work at the very beginning of their fellowship. Um, they've now, I understand, submitted their report. And what they're going to do is each of the fellows is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we've got time for questions. And I'm going to pass the word first to Michelle. No, Nicola's Nic here. Nicola's here, great. Okay, I'm gonna pass the word to Nicola to begin without more ado, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, I saw you sent that um, link through. I don't know why my Zoom wasn't launching, but eventually did. So hello, everybody. And um, thank you for giving Michelle and Emmanuel and me a chance to speak today. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Just a reminder for maybe people who weren't here at the, um, the previous time when we very pre briefly presented what we were going to be doing. The three of us fellows were appointed as um, fellows for the future of language or languages research. The call was a little bit ambiguous. And our remit was to look at the threats, risking and uh, risks and opportunities um, for this area of funding and a, quite an inclusive um, uh, definition of languages research. And the outcome was, um, as Charles has already mentioned, a report for the team, um, the AHRC, which we just submitted um, yesterday. Um, so here's who we are, me, uh, Nicola, what next for languages research in the UK was my sort of working title. And I've just wanted to mention here in case I forgot to say it later, Katie Harrison was the postdoc on the project and she did an absolutely brilliant job. And some of you will have had an interview with her, but she did a huge amount of work in co-designing the survey, making it happen, doing the preliminary round of um, analysis um, and helping me with some of the subsequent analysis. So a very big thank you um, to her. Uh, the other fellows were Michelle McLeod um, with focus on indigenous languages and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Labour from Aston, the Brum project, looking particularly at Birmingham's language needs as a case study. Um, and uh, Emmanuel was suggesting we should treat these photos as the before photos and the after photos is how we feel after um, having had quite a tight time scale to submit our um, reports. But anyway, we have managed it now. Uh, so quickly moving on to my part of the project um, or my sort of strand was really to do a, a, a kind of overview of what we know about languages research um, in the UK, what there is and what's emerging um, and how we might get to some ideal future state. So um, I did some desk-based research looking at various documents and reports, um, most of which is in the public domain. Um, also had a survey, which thank you, a lot of you uh, filled out, 150 PhD students and uh, 386 post-PhD researchers. So altogether, that's about 500 people. Um, if you bear in mind that the REF, the, for the unit of assessment, um, modern languages and linguistics, there were about 1600 staff submitted to that. Um, so 386 or 500, if you include the PhD students, is not a bad response rate at all, actually. Obviously not everyone who is a languages researcher was submitted to that panel, but still it is, um, uh, I think, a creditable response rate and a massive thank you to everybody who um, actually took the time to fill out the survey and gave us quite a lot of detail. Um, we also had some interviews, as I've mentioned, mix of career stages and type of institution. And we were able to draw on some notes that the AHRC had um, with uh, 
uh, from their own meetings with various subject association leaders and um, the Auri award holders, for example, um, and various other contacts. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of the geographical distribution of the survey responses and to try and it's very difficult to know what the benchmark would be. So I've compared it to the REF 2021 uh, unit of um, unit of assessment 26, modern languages and linguistics. According to that, in our survey, responses from England are a little bit underrepresented uh, or somewhat really underrepresented and Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland all somewhat overrepresented. I don't know what, how much that tells us, but just to give you a sort of sense of that distribution. Um, coming on quickly to some of the uh, things that we found, um, if this is a relatively representative uh, survey, then we have two thirds of PhD students female um, versus uh, male. Just a quick word, we talked about female and male. If I had my time again, I would have asked about women and men and do you identify at what gender do you identify as non-binary and transgender? But that's the wording that we took over from another survey, which I now um, wish we'd done a little bit differently. Um, so that's quite a good uh, proportion in the sense that it matches the numbers taking or the proportions taking a language at A level and at undergraduate level. So we're not losing uh, researchers through to um, or using women on the way through the pipeline, which often happens. Um, on the other hand, uh, it hasn't yet caught up with the staffing profile. And uh, it means that men in a couple of decades time will be underrepresented uh, in this field. Um, another interesting point we have about the pipeline into languages research is just the background. We asked where people had studied before they began their PhD. And as you can see from this table here, um, only 53% of PhD students currently did their undergraduate degree in the UK. So that's an awful lot from outside. And if you look at the ones who are AHRC funded, not a huge sample, but nevertheless, 35% um, of those are uh, from, uh, did an undergraduate degree outside the UK. Um, a higher percentage of people then came and did an MA in the UK. But I think that is something for reflection that there is, our PhD pipeline is getting an awful lot of injection from outside, which is good, we want international, um, but we might want to reflect on uh, whether that's the, the right proportion and how that compares with other areas. Uh, we also asked a quick question about disability. EDI wasn't really our, um, Equality, diversity and inclusion wasn't our main focus, but since we did ask, I'll report it. Um, the levels of uh, numbers of uh, proportion of people re reporting a disability is lower than you'd expect compared to the background population, quite a bit lower, um, and much lower amongst those applying for funding. Although those who do apply for funding in our survey anyway, um, actually had relatively good success rate once they actually had applied. Um, where is languages research happening? This is just a quick um, one of the many things you could find out by looking at the REF data that's in the public domain. And again, looking only at the UOA for modern languages and linguistics. Um, so there were 44 universities represented, a few made double submissions. Half of those were from Russell Group universities and half from non-Russell Group universities. Um, there are of course many more Russell Group universities. Um, so that makes a difference. Um, and in terms of student numbers, uh, sorry, staff numbers submitted, 72% were from Russell Group institutions. So certainly they're dominant in terms of the, the numbers of researchers. Um, and just to note that, of course, some researchers will have been submitted to area studies, particularly if they're in Asian, uh, one of the Asian languages, or perhaps to 34, which is communication, culture and media studies, or indeed um, education. Um, we asked about people's distribution, uh, sorry, the people's expertise from in the survey. 75% of our responses selected European as one of their sort of broad regions. We asked about the broad area initially. Amongst those, 25% um, uh, also mentioned one, one or more parts of the Americas, 10% specified Africa. I guess in a lot of cases, we're looking at post-colonial context there. Um, and then the next largest group was um, indigenous languages, um, in the UK and Ireland, followed by South or Central American uh, and so on, as you can see there. Um, we also had a look at um, languages. We did this by asking people to write in what language they did uh, rather than try and have a drop down list. So we had to group in a particular way. Um, 
The most represented is probably, as you'd expect, French is at the top, 29% of respondents uh, mention French. Um, English is pretty high ranked, but in a, nearly all cases, it was alongside another language, so someone working comparatively. Then we've got German, Spanish, and, and or Portuguese on about 20%, which breaks down into, for Spanish or Portuguese, um, a combination of Spanish and Portuguese, as you can see there. Um, and then working down through the percentages, Italian, Japanese, Russian, Polish, and then the Celtic languages, which um, uh, Michelle will say much more about, um, and then various other languages mentioned there. So, I mean, for example, Arabic is a, considered quite a strategic language for um, the UK, but um, quite low representation among our expertise. Um, only 3% of people mentioned it, and quite often in combination with another language rather than it being their main focus. Um, we also asked about subject classifications uh, that people identified with. And um, I'm, I know I'm really whizzing through here, but I want to try and cover as much ground as I can. Um, I guess the, the main standout thing here is that literature is still top at 52% um, among all the... People could choose as many answers as they wanted, but 52% was the highest ranked um, area. And you can see various other areas there um, and uh, more there. Um, quite good match between um, PhD students and researchers, the same kind of uh, top 10, more or less. We also asked people to mention what other labels they would like um, or they would naturally use. And you can see there some of the most common mentioned ones. Again, we've grouped them a little bit. So this reflects how I've grouped the data that we've got. But memory studies is quite a long way up there as long as, as well as critical theory, comparative literature, translation studies and so on. Um, we asked about disciplinarity and asked people to say uh, interdisciplinarity, to what extent people felt their research was interdisciplinary in one way or another. Um, the vast majority felt it was in some way, so only 4% not, said not in any way at all. For some people, interdisciplinarity means that they just use a, no a different number of different perspectives themselves as an individual, but still a lone researcher. Um, but then between 30 and 40 or 43%, uh, work either with someone in the same language from a different perspective or with another language or with another subject area. So pretty good um, sense of interdisciplinarity, which I think comes out of the REF report um, as well. We also asked about people's experience of working with partners of any kind. Well, we tried to think of pretty much any kind. Um, and 76% uh, have worked with some kind of partner at some point in some way. And really interestingly, and I think significantly for us, 48% reported some kind of uh, collaboration with someone outside, with a partner outside the UK. And that is something that I think is a particular strength, which we need to be um, reflecting back to um, uh, the UK with our expertise in that. I uh, haven't got time to go into it here, but people gave us lots of detail. So a massive thank you again to everybody who filled this out. It's quite a laborious bit of the survey to fill out, and it was really helpful to have that depth of detail that we had. We also asked about working with government. Um, about 18% of our respondents have worked with government in some capacity, um, most commonly local government, but also the devolved and to some, a lesser extent the uh, national government. And again, we have a bit more detail on that. We asked about methods and uh, skills development and areas that people uh, were particularly interested in seeing their skills develop were digital skills of various kinds, digital analysis, representation, visualization of data, um, and strong interest as well in more about co-designing research with stakeholders um, and also approaches to communicating research results um, in creative uh, and different ways. Um, other areas mentioned uh, when we asked, invited people to make their own suggestions were broadly in these areas. So mapping and spatial visualization um, of, uh, of data, linguistic landscape analysis, various uh, software packages, some of them for analyzing um, data uh, in quantitative ways, other things as well, using virtual reality, working with uh, developing apps, um, and quite a lot on just collaboration generally with different kinds of partners, including working equitably with partners. Uh, we asked about funding, likes and dislikes. All the current modes of funding had quite strong support, 
between 75 and 88 percent. So fund, that's funding from the AHRC. Um, except for follow on funding for impact, which was 55 or 56 percent, um, with a few people commenting that it's a double bite of the cherry. So you, if you've had funding once, it's much easier to get follow on funding and then that benefits you perhaps disproportionately in your, in your home institution where funding is so important. Um, we asked about what kinds of funding people might like. There was strong support for more lower ceiling grants for pump priming up to say around 50,000 or mid-range grants, less than the standard grant where at the moment the ceiling is 1 million and you can always put something in for 100,000, but the uh, experience seems to be that on the whole, they, those are quite big grants that people put in. Uh, postdoc fellowships were also um, uh, saw a lot of support, like the Leverhulme and uh, British Academy Fellowships. I'm not sure the HRC is likely to go down that route, but it was mentioned by a lot of people. Um, worth saying as well that there was strong support for continuing responsive mode funding. So that is not a themed call. You can just talk about um, that you can apply with whatever project you want. Um, that was never in doubt. That was almost one of the first things that uh, we were told in our briefing. But um, so many people said it, I thought I'd better reflect it here. Um, and one a, a sort of recurrent theme was also that the HRC could do a little more to reflect disparities amongst different um, universities and institutions in the degree of support that is available when you're going for funding like this and the degree of, degree of mentoring. Um, so that may be something for us uh, to reflect on. And um, very nearly at the end, we asked about research areas that are current or emerging. We gave some suggestions and you can see in that bullet point list there, the areas that are um, that were most commonly chosen. Um, and then other people, we also invited people to make their own, um, come up with their own uh, indications of what they saw as emerging in their field. It's quite hard to summarise it here very briefly, but a really common thread through a lot of this was strong emphasis on, on values-driven research from various different perspectives. So social justice, um, uh, revisiting what's most prominent, whose voices are heard, um, uh, and uh, some of that linked in actually, not always explicitly, but could be linked into sustainable development goals, um, climate emergency, um, and so on. Uh, and I've galloped through, uh, but still taken too long. That's me done. So shall I I'll stop sharing my screen? And I don't know, we're going to go straight on to the next person and then have questions at the yeah. end, Charles. Thank you very much, Nicola. I think, I think we'll do that. Yeah. Should we have the three presentations and then we'll have, you know, a good 15 minutes for, for questions. Michelle. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm just opening up my PowerPoints. There we go. There we are. Thanks, thanks, Nicola. Thanks everybody for and um, the IMLR for asking us back to talk about our findings. So as Nicola said, my part of the project was specifically looking at the research landscape of the UK's indigenous languages. Um, and the languages that I looked at as part of my research were British Sign Language, Cornish, Gaelic, Irish, Manx, Scots, Ulster Scots and Welsh. So I used five research instruments to gather my data. I undertook a piece of desk research, first of all, looking at the research reports commissioned, undertaken by the government agencies. There were 36 research reports that I looked at. I carried out interviews with senior stakeholders in 18 language, and um, government or um, agencies. So sometimes there was more than one person in each of these agencies, but 18 organizations, government departments, language bodies all together. After that, I had a questionnaire and I want to thank my postdoc um, assistant for helping a lot with the questionnaire, uh, Dr. Don Leslie. And this went to smaller organizations, if you like. So these would be third sector organizations involved in language promotion, um, the arts, culture, heritage, but also public bodies for whom language was not their um, primary interest. So arts councils, for example, heritage organizations. I also interviewed 
eight senior academics from the various languages um, to ask them their opinions on, on what the research landscape was, was, what the needs were. And I also had the opportunity to look at a specific data set of the um, Indigenous languages researchers from Nicola's questionnaire that she just spoke about. So these are the tools. Um, because of time pressures, I'm really just going to talk about my findings from uh, the interviews and the questionnaire today. So from the interviews with the senior stakeholders, I was able to gather information about uh, current interaction practices between HE researchers and language stakeholders. I was also able to ascertain information about um, the challenges associated with accessing research to support language policy and implementation of policy or indeed um, language promotion activities. So when there was research available, how easy was it for the, the non-academics to access that? Um, I looked at processes around research between the, the academy and the stakeholders, so collaborative research, commissioned research, co-created research, um, and then just um, what, what worked best for, for both partners. <clears throat> I looked at current research themes, what was currently happening, and also future research needs. And I'll just look at the future research needs just now. So I think top of the bill of the research needs for the stakeholders, the government departments, was education. Um, that could be immersion education. They wanted information on language pedagogy, on recruitment to schools, on retention, on transition across the, the various levels. And um, this was um, very much preschool, primary school, secondary school, not higher education. Nobody was asking for research on um, what was going on in the university sector, interestingly enough. And they were interested in adult language acquisition, and this is learning outside of the formal sector, um, measuring uh, the success of various initiatives that are happening there and how, how we get more people learning the languages in these communities. There was very much interest in interdisciplinary work with psychology, psychology particularly because the stakeholders, the government departments, the agencies were all really interested in who speaks language X, why they do that, and more importantly, why, why they don't, what are the barriers to using uh, the language when they have the ability to use this language. So there, there was demand for a lot of research around language use. Um, demographics, just basic big data still needed on um, numbers of speakers, gender, location, age, that type of thing. Um, an interesting one was the need for more research on the, the theory, the principles of language planning as an academic discipline. The, the stakeholders were all very cognizant, I think, of the, the the, this is in a reversing language shift situation in particular, um, that they needed to understand the success or otherwise of their policies. So in addition to more research on the principles and theory of language planning and policy, they were also interested in um, ascertaining some kind of tool to measure the success of the implementation of their policies. And this, this request, um, occurred across all of the languages. There was also demand for more language marketing, understanding how to market language effectively, um, how to be better, ad be better advocates for language. And finally, but definitely by no means uh, of, of any less importance, there was still strong demand for corpus research with technology. So in, in lexicography, onomastics, translation, uh, any of these big corpus types research, but so long as it's um, techno proof for, the, for, for coming years. So lots of requests for technology research too. 
So, so moving on to look at the data that I got from the questionnaire. Um, so I had responses from 33 organizations across all of the languages that I was concerned with. Um, and these could be, uh, we had language organizations, so third sector organizations for whom language was their primary interest, promotion of language, but also arts, independent media companies, publishing, cultural environment, historic environments, so on. So 69% of these organizations have conducted research to inform their activities, 31% have not. From the questionnaire, I was able to gather information on the research practices of these smaller organizations. Um, I was able to get data on how they have worked with the HE sector, uh, information on the challenges faced by these organizations regarding accessing or um, commissioning research, and also information on their future research aspirations. Now, the screen here, um, you can see a oh, list of their previous research focus pretty much similar to their future research aspirations and also thematically quite similar to what the, the large public bodies, government organizations have, have an interest in as well. I think one of the main differences here though is around a community level engagement, perhaps not surprisingly that they have an interest in micro language planning as, a, as well as macro at a macro level. Um, so you can see here how these small organizations have conducted research. Some of them do have some kind of in-house research capacity. Only 10% of them have commissioned research from universities, although 30% of them have worked with university-led research. So there's a bit of a difference there between commissioning and um, the universities going to the organizations and saying, shall we do this together? And I think this data here gives some indication of, of why it might be difficult for the universities to work with these smaller organizations. You can see here the average cost of a piece of research um, is less than £20,000. Always, they don't have, no research has cost this group more than £20,000. And for those of us involved in um, higher education, trying to persuade our contracts team that it's of value to participate for such a small sum is tricky. Um, nonetheless, we see here that, that about half of the organizations have worked with the university sector on a semi-frequent basis. Now that's not necessarily research. Um, in another question, I have uh, more detail about public engagement, um, types of lecture series and so on. So it's not just research that, that we see happening across these sectors. So I move on quickly to look at what my senior academic colleagues said about research in this area. I think it's worth um, reflecting what they said about the responsibility that they feel towards their language communities. And I think that pretty much all language researchers feel this sense of responsibility to the sector as we fear the 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 what, what we see what's going on with lang language departments closing but that sense of um responsibility to the sector I think is even greater for the indigenous languages community researchers where they see um this kind of existential threat to the languages um, in the communities. So they, they, talk, they all talked about the additional responsibility beyond their normal teaching research and service activities. Um, they wanted very much to stress that there's a need for culture-based research, um, just emphasizing of course that language does not exist in a cultureless vacuum and that any research going forward must continue uh, to investigate um, culture. They also wanted to stress the importance of interlanguage collaboration. Um, so that's languages to languages, but not just within the HE environment, uh, and that there's space to collaborate between public bodies, practitioners, and HE, and they were very keen to do this. 
So just a couple of main reflections before I finish off. Uh, I think one thing that came across quite strongly from all of the data was just the special status of the UK Indigenous languages and just, um, just to remind people that in various uh, devolved regions that there is significant legislation supporting the languages there where there isn't legislation there is strong policy so there is of course uh, a need for research and, and a knowledge gap around certain areas so there's certainly capacity and potential for HE to fill this gap and to support the the legislative and policy um, situation in the various devolved regions um, also, just to note the language as a vehicle of culture and heritage, um, the UK's Indigenous languages are vehicles for rich cultural heritage, modern and ancient, and one way to support the vitality of this is, of course, through, through research. Um, to note, of course, that language is a tool for social inclusion. Uh, many of the Indigenous language speakers felt that uh, that that they were excluded um, from social settings, education and the likes, uh, but research here could support that. And my final word is on collaboration, um, that there is a need for collaboration across languages and across researchers, stakeholders, and um, I'll talk a bit more about that in the next session. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed, Michelle. Um, and we'll move now to the final presentation, which is Emmanuel. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen. I'm not sure if I'm successful there. Can you see my screen? Yes, That's, that yes, yes, excellent. Okay, so my project was School Birmingham Research for Upholding Multilingualism, just because I wanted to be able to call it BRUM, because I've never been able to resist a good pun or indeed a bad one. Those of you who came to our first presentation may remember uh, those pictures of my first year students who were very much my inspiration in this project, because this is a kind of population um, that may be excluded for, uh, from learning languages um, at university if the trend goes the way it is at the moment. So nothing has changed since then, except that I've updated my picture, uh, as uh, uh, Nicolette mentioned, and this is very much how I feel after a very exhilarating, but also very tiring project. So the challenge basically that we are facing is that on the one hand, we are convinced that all discipline is really worthwhile, but we also have to prove our existence. And throughout my research, I came across a report from uh, throughout time, especially this one from more than one century ago, where you have that uh, report that was commanded by, commissioned by the government, and it was about showing uh, the importance uh, of languages, the study of languages, um, in, uh, on the one hand, uh, the appreciation of humanities, but also the interest of commerce and public service. So very much the same story one century later. What I wanted to do in my project was to document the presence of languages in Birmingham with focus on education, business, public services and culture. And I wanted very much to include those voices that wouldn't be maybe traditionally um, um, poll in this kind of uh, research. And I wanted to identify real life needs for language research because in my own context, well, that was really the kind of thing instrumental that were needed. So for uh, the education um, sector, I um, went to, to visit some, some school. I had uh, big plans to, to visit lots of school, but because of the, the strikes, uh, my ethic application was delayed. So then there were the Easter holidays. So I had to uh, reduce my ambition, but uh, I developed also an online survey where I pulled uh, primary and secondary teachers. I also had a look into what's happening with adult education 
and uh, the learning of languages outside schools. And then I had an opportunity because uh, we I'm part of the EDI committee and uh, we were uh, thinking of having an EDI week. So I said, well, languages might not be uh, a protected characteristic, but you know, if you don't speak the language, you're not included. So everybody thought, oh yeah, so <laughs> go for it. And well, they closed the window. So I went, uh, they closed the door and I went through the window and I had an online uh, survey uh, of Aston languages followed by focus group. So what came out of that? Well, first of all, uh, if we want to do language research, we need to maintain a healthy pipeline. And that's why uh, schools are so important for us. When I asked school teachers what they saw the problems were behind the, the decline of languages, they came with lots of things. Well, top down decision like uh, the difficulty of GCSE, harsh marking, the result driven culture, which is very much what we know of, the wider po uh, political context with Brexit and the attitudes towards languages. Pandemic also had uh, an impact on the progression of students. And something that I discovered was very prevalent was a problem in recruiting language teachers. All my school but one, one grammar school, reported that they had struggled to find language teachers. A big problem as well, and that has been uh, uh, detailed in the Ripple project is the transition between primary, secondary, and basically lots of lots of opportunities in maintaining the continuity between the two levels. They were keen uh, to work closer with us, and they were very keen, for example, uh, on ambassador schemes. And it's great to know that uh, the special interest group in UCML is trying to revive that ambassador schemes that had been. Uh, so uh, successful. They also need more promotion material of languages. How can you convince, especially in schools in, um, uh, well, difficult areas, not very privileged, how do you show them that it's useful to do uh, studies in languages? They want it to be upscaled in uh, languages, but also research skills, because there was not many opportunities of collaboration for research between schools and universities. And when it happened, it was more often the university uh, that has, a, let's say, a, an app to try and they wanted to use the school as a playground, not so much, you know, what are your problems? How can we help? Um, in the survey, I asked the team foreman about the kind of research they, they would be interested in. And maybe not surprisingly, there was a difference between what the secondary school and primary school teacher answered. For the uh, secondary school teacher, obviously motivation was uh, a big thing, speech bothered, as Catherine said, would say. For primary school teacher, it was more the effectiveness of teaching approaches because they feel much more out of their depths uh, because they have to, to teach the, those languages. They don't always feel qualified to teach. Other things they mentioned is was uh, that more research was needed into uh, the different schemes for, for teaching, the transition, not only between primary and secondary, but also when you choose your GCSEs or A-level, lack of motivation uh, came back, the bridging of achievement gaps uh, according to literacy skills or gender, and also the fact that they didn't feel that multilingualism that was very much present in school was not built upon uh, by the system. Them. For example, uh, there are community languages that have disappeared, uh, for example, and Romanian, a big one in uh, some of the school I, I went into, uh, was not uh, possible as a GCSE subject. Now, uh, for adult education, what was important as research question for them was some things that we could have uh, maybe predicted the impact of the, the pandemic on the way people uh, learn languages. Also, obviously, the financial crisis on top of them, because when you do adult course, evening courses, it's more money on top of it. And funnily enough, something that I hadn't planned at all in Birmingham, the impact on the clean air zone, because the uh, adult education center uh, I interview, uh, well, they are in the center. So there are lots of things that are completely outside languages that have, in fact, a very important impact on uh, uh, languages and its vitality. Uh, 
Now about the Western language survey. It was about um, the, the perception of people about languages, their knowledge about languages. So people were um, ask about their native language, and there was a wide range of languages, um, just loan languages and language in combination, 76 in my sample. But what was interesting is that those native languages were quite different from uh, the known languages. So when people were asked, what is your um, best known language? English was much more often uh, quoted and given. So it was interesting that there was a kind of great, uh, change in the, the languages. Um, you had English as something useful, but not so much something that people felt very much attached to. And the more we were going into second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth best known languages, you had some kind of grouping. So for example, first English, then it was the heritage languages then the school language, then special interest languages, mainly religious languages like Arabic or Hebrew. When people were asked about their favorite language, that was a, an interesting one because it seems that the English speakers are less attached to their languages than, for example, uh, the French speaker. What was interesting as well is that um, there were quite a few people learning languages, 14 different languages. But when I asked them, well, what language would you like to study? There was a much wider range of choice, even a Klingon, like you know, a Star Trek language. So there is an interest for languages there, but maybe we don't have the, uh, the choice and the opportunities for that appetite for language. Now, in the focus group, what was interesting was to see how the different groups saw uh, the importance of languages in the running of a university. So for researchers, it was interesting to have other languages because in some uh, discipline, for example, engineering, German would have been important. It was also important because it gave and it gives an international dimension to the research you are able to access more research. And also it gives you the confidence maybe to go out of the country for a postdoc because you can do your research in English, but you know, if you cannot speak anything of the language around you, you feel very much an, an outsider. That was also the, the feeling of postgraduate students. Teaching staff were very keen on languages because they saw that the more languages students had, the more agile they were intellectually. They could see different viewpoints, different worldview. And they saw that their own multilingualism was also uh, very good to support languages, for example, languages for whom uh, students for whom uh, English was not the main languages. Professional staff were very keen on languages, and that was a bit of a surprise for me because they saw that that, that enhanced their skills. For example, there were uh, people in the library who took on new languages to be able to support better the, the department they were supporting. They saw that it was a way of better serving the student population uh, that is very much multilingual at Aston. Now, uh, going into uh, businesses, I went to interview people in language related businesses and more general languages, uh, more general businesses. So for the language businesses, I spoke to somebody very prominent in the translation uh, world, and she, she was very generous in uh, giving me some uh, figures about the kind of language needs they had in uh, a company. And you can see that uh, the, the focus is very much on European languages, the BRICS languages. So those are the big languages with French, German, Spanish still being uh, very big. Interesting things was the changes in the profession, for example, the sectors that moved from manufacturing to services, the different activities, it's not just translation, but post-editing, proofreading, the fact that you're working more and more uh, with AI, with technology, and delocalization, just because you can work remotely, but also because often they were struggling to find people with the right skill in, in the region. I also talked to um, somebody uh, who, who is running the, the Cream Center at Aston, so it's the Center for Research in Ethnic uh, Entrepreneurship, and they're doing lots of wonderful things with uh, those uh, minority entrepreneurs, but it never occurred to them that languages was in fact very impactful and very important in their work. 
So they need to learn English, obviously, to do business in uh, this country. But there is a lot that could be done also uh, tapping into that wealth of linguistics resources they, they use, uh, they have. And much has been done about our international um, contacts for, for businesses. And we've had the, the wonderful uh, report by Wendy very recently. But there are also those community languages that could be used uh, for or international business. Now going into public services, in healthcare, I went to talk to people in the NHS and the people in charge of interpreting. And here you can see that the languages uh, are very much community languages with a very variable provision. In some services, you have a trained uh, interpreter with a diploma in public service interpreting. And then in other, it seems to be, well, somebody of the community who happens to be around. What is interesting in those uh, many languages for which they were requested is that they can very much uh, recreate the history of the country because you've got the languages of the former empire, you have the languages of migration and crisis. Interestingly, lots of uh, requests for BSL, but also, and in the 20 most frequently um, requested languages, there was uh, French and Spanish, but French and Spanish not as we know them, because those uh, requests for French and Spanish were often from people who had transited through Spain and France, uh, coming from Africa, and the same applied to Italian and Portuguese. So maybe that would be a second win for our research in French, Spanish, and our uh, more uh, traditional languages. For school support, for those kids who don't have English as their first language, they were very much also really reliant on community languages, but not institutionalized. What happens, it seems most of the time, is that social workers have got community languages. Well, you know, they will start and uh, go and talk to the kids, but there is no um, provision that is there. Those kids who come into a uh, British school where they need to learn English pretty fast, and maybe there are lessons for, for us working uh, with the more traditional modern foreign languages, we could maybe learn from the way they're working to acquire, to help uh, the classroom, the MFL class, classroom. They're also working links with the community, trying to reconcile their um, heritage uh, culture and the British values. So again, lots of uh, um, correspondence there between languages and culture. And finally, in the culture, um, there has been um, quite a lot of very good research that has been carried out in Birmingham. You may have heard about the T-Lang project about trans languages by Angela Kreese and the uh, SL language, part of the ORI project uh, by Rajinder Dutra. And obviously there is still a lot to be done there, uh, a lot about who is uh, representing those community languages, who are the voices who represent those groups. Also maybe that uh, creativity could be used uh, to, to convey messages like health messages in community languages. So there would be a lot more to be done. We did also uh, a little bit of linguistic landscaping in the city center. We went to the library to look at the, the kind of books uh, in other languages that were available. Some things were quite interesting. For example, a very, very big provision for um, Chinese, much more than any other languages, maybe because of their the dual status of languages that is community, but also lots of international students. And obviously there is also a lot of efforts uh, from uh, the Chinese government through the Confucius and so on to uh, bring the culture uh, as part of relating uh, to, to the countries in the West. This is also interesting because it gives us another view on the, the languages that are actually spoken in the community because the census is the reported uh, impression of what people are doing. But when we look at language around us in uh, the background, in, in the public place, Places that gives us a much accurate view of what's actually happening. We did also a little bit of uh, research in the languages of community and faith group because they often do some work with um, languages and maybe we should tap a bit more in that wealth of uh, um, skills that they have. 
So to conclude, what we need to, to think is that if we want to do language research, we need to think of sustainability of languages. And that means also we're working more with other groups, with schools. We also need to, to advocate for, for languages. And this is very much something that has been done in the recent years, but we need to do more of that because this is needed. We should encourage widening participation in and of languages, trying to get on board those people who are not maybe involved in research, and also bringing more languages to reflect the actual languages in society. And that uh, uh, research should be more co-produced with those people contributing research questions as well. So I was asked to, to conclude very unwisely by uh, my two other fellows. So this is the end of us as the AHRC's angels. But obviously uh, the recommendation we have made and we cannot share, sorry, that will be taken over by AHRC and what the uh, future of um, research, language research funding will be. Well, we don't know more than you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel, for concluding and for Michelle and Nicola. We, we have some time for, for questions, but I think we have to sort of ask questions quickly. So any questions on the work that uh, the fellows have accomplished? I think then I'll begin by saying, so you, you've, you've mapped the disciplinary diversity, you've mapped the stages within um, that different people are working on. You've talked about the geographical uh, distribution. You talked about wider societal engagement with languages. You and you've used very different uh, representative examples. So, in a sense, you've provided the ground for the HRC to think about its funding initiatives in by doing this comprehensive mapping, rather than necessarily suggesting the exact the the areas where that funding should be um, should be produced. Um, not quite, but we are not able to talk about our recommendations. So that's why my survey, for example, was very much on the what, uh, what has been surfaced and less about what we've recommended. So we have jointly, out of the work that emerged from our three different reports, put forward some suggestions, um, but we have been asked not to talk about those. So. Um, Probing questions are welcome, but that's why my presentation in particular, I, sh I meant to say that at the beginning, is an awful lot about um, th the background information that led up to our conversations and then the report that we put in. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nicola, for that <clears throat> um, precision there. Um, there's a question in the chat that we might look at. Thanks very much for this fabulous talk. I was wondering about the evidence of need for those of Caribbean heritage, especially in view of the dominance of battle. Could you respond? Um, I don't know if Michelle's about to leap in with her overview of the indigenous, no, okay. Um, so um, looking at my survey, at our survey, there was not a huge amount uh, of detail um, about uh, Caribbean heritage. Um, it, the, the Caribbean was mentioned a couple of times, I don't know, Emmanuel, if you had anything from your um, uh, work on community languages, you may have more to say. Well, not an awful lot, but there was a mention of Patois and the fact that uh, it was very important. I think that um, with all those maybe smaller language heritage languages, what uh, was very striking is that people are very much affectively attached to those. And that, you know, when you don't take that into account, you're really uh, getting against people who they are and languages are very much part of the identity. So from that, from that point of view, it's also something very important to take into uh, account the diversity of languages in the diversity of identities. Thank you um, for that. There are some questions in there. I mean, what one what question I think everyone is asking uh, is we kind of understand that you know that we were uh, guarded about the, the recommendations and, and but but although the, the HRC is obviously in this case being very guarded. And Liz's question is simply when are, are we going to see a report of the recommendations or, uh, or, or yeah, or we've or we're going to deduce this in time? 
Um, I'll, I'll go first, perhaps. Um, we certainly plan, um, well, there are a few things that we plan to do that will be public with a bit more information. Um, one of the things that I plan to do with Katie from our project is to write an article for, we hope modern language is open. And if the timing of that is right, we may be able to say a little bit more about it in the light of what the HRC um, decide to do. Um, I can't imagine that they're gonna make that report that we submitted uh, public, but there may be things um, that we can say. Um, I've, I know there's a question further down um, about um, PhD researchers, but I can come back to that later after Michelle and Emmanuel have perhaps commented. I don't think I've got much to, to add to that, Nicola, and that um, I, I don't think we're not expecting them to publish our recommendations. Um, I suppose if they take our recommendations and um, as full, we might at some point go, there we go. But um, no, we can't say anything more about the recommendations. Um, we're all waiting to see. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think the, the very comprehensive uh, and inclusive way you've gone about your work, I think, uh, is really very impressive um, on, for all our uh, part. There is a Petro, uh, Petros has, has made a, a, a question. So you've talked about the uh, proportion of researchers coming to the UK. I mean, yeah, what might, what, how might we think about this? What would be an acceptable proportion? Can you perhaps um, gloss that a bit further? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mentioned that finding because I was surprised by it. I was particularly surprised that only 53% of our postgrads have done their undergraduate work in the UK. It may turn out that across the funding councils, that's more or less standard or across the areas within the HRC, that's more or less standard. And it just reflects a really healthy international um, uh, market. If, we, if that's the right word, or competition anyway. Um, but it could be that some of our own homegrown students are in a sense being outcompeted in some way, um, and that very good candidates who are UK homegrown are not getting through to the PhD. So that might be something that we would want to do a little bit more um, digging into. It's interesting because in Janice Carruthers, the I can never remember the correct title. Anyway, the Leadership Fellow for Modern Languages, Janice Carruthers, um, did some work quite early on in her fellowship where she found a little bit of evidence that international students were perhaps being disadvantaged in the process of going for HRC funding through the DTPs, sometimes because their referees didn't understand the game of what a decent, what the right kind of reference looks like. Um, our data suggests that from this survey anyway, suggests that that isn't the case and that actually they're doing very well. In fact, a lot of them, a certain proportion of students from overseas are coming over for an MA, which then gives them the, the sort of into the system and the, the excellent um, links with referees who might be able to comment for their, their um, external, for their applications. So I haven't got the answer, but I, it was an interesting statistic and I would like to see it alongside other data. Thank you, Nicola. Indeed. One, thing, one thing that may be interesting to notice as well, it's not linked with research, but uh, all those people with competence in languages, uh, teachers, uh, translators, there are lots and lots coming from abroad. And that's a, that I think is quite worrying about the sustainability long term. Like, for example, I mentioned that the only school that didn't uh, mention having problems recruiting, they had four and a half FTE, three of which were uh, foreigners. And um, while well, they say, well, they're very subtle, you know, they're 40s, 50s with English partners. OK, well, you know, that's my generation and you could come easily and settle. But things have changed with Brexit. So I think we should really think of the pipeline because uh, there could be very significant gaps in, in languages uh, across the board in the generation to come if we're not careful. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Naomi uh, Siegel makes a point about the, yes, it's more difficult, of course, now for people to come to uh, do PhD, noticeably more difficult. And I think this is going to be an issue and one that we should watch. Um, I think Hilary um, Footed in the chat is also saying, well, I mean, there is, I mean, okay, one can understand a certain guarded nature on the AHRC. However, 
it would be, and it, and it is necessary for us to be thinking about the work, to be pursuing it inclusively, but we, it is, in a, it, it would be good to know when this kind of dialogue with the AHRC about how it thinks about the recommendations, where it takes that, how we're involved. I mean, it's a very healthy dialogue to have. And, it, and I think the answer is, is that we need to sort of push the AHRC a bit um, and, and see that this is a staged process. But do you want to, Nicola, I saw you unmuted. Do you want to come back on that? Um, yes, I mean, I hope there'll be a point where we can perhaps say a little bit more than we can say right now. Um, the other thing, perhaps to say is that there is quite a lot of data that is not the for isn't directly a recommendation to the HRC but which is of information that will be very interesting and valuable hopefully to subject associations and other funders so um, I think there will be interesting material to read even if you don't actually get to see the um, those key pages of recommendations thank you um Wendy makes the point that um, the final recommendations for Auri were made to the HRC and they've not yet been published. I think there is a, a question for us to quite rightly, I mean, to say, yeah, absolutely, we understand certain working uh, methods and so forth, but we can push, I think, the HRC a little bit to, 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 get, to come back and, and say what it can and to talk about its recommendation. I think we will do that. Um, Jonathan makes a, a point, how worried should we be? about the very high FD submission to REV from Russell Group institutions. I'm not altogether sure we can, we can answer that question here. I think that is a, is a very good question. Um, I'll just give the fellows an opportunity to respond or, or not. Well, I think it's a very, well, for me, I'm worried because it means that uh, more and more the views might be those of a privileged part of the population. So. That, that's why I made the point at the beginning about, you know, showing the picture of my, my students and those people might be out of languages when maybe you're not teaching languages outside the Russell groups. So, um, yeah, I think it would certainly impoverish of you the, the way uh, we're looking at widening participation if we're not from, from those uh, backgrounds. I mean, I've learned lots of things that, you know, I was not aware of just by taking that approach of going to ask people. And uh, it's important, I think, to have lots of voices if we want to be representative. Thank you. Nicola. There was some uh, really interesting qualitative data, particularly in some of our interviews um, about this question, and some people very eloquently making the point about the need to have a diverse group of researchers um, so that you have a diverse kind of research being done also that's to some extent rooted in local communities. So um, there is, I think, a, an issue. Uh, there is an issue there. Um, the other sort of slight um, qualification I would add is that that data that I cited was looking at the um, UOA 26 Modern Languages and Linguistics specifically. And there are a number of researchers who would have gone into one of those other panels and perhaps more likely the case in the um, non-Russell group institutions where they're less likely to be in a unit that is labeled languages or some kind of version of that. So those researchers may be around, but not as visible um, in the way I conducted the exercise anyway. But that's not to say that there isn't an issue, there is. Thank you very much for that. And this is something very much to take up with UCM, UCML. Um, this is a, a question that will be debated in, uh, on, <coughs> uh, on the 15th of July at the plenary. Not a question, but I've launched a widening participation languages network, a special interest group of UCML to support languages at universities that offer languages to degree level at below average entry tariffs. Thank you very much for that, Becky. And I think we'll take the last comment on, uh, in the chat of this part of the session. Uh, Michelle, did you find a lot of community, uh, sorry, commonality between stakeholders in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland? Can we begin to see a divergence between the devolved nations and England? Good question. I certainly saw a lot of commonality uh, between Wales and Scotland, difference in size, but uh, because they both have uh, language legislation uh, similar types of language legislation, it does promote particular activity. Difference, obviously, in Northern Ireland because of the, the, the diff different um, political situation there, uh, 
but still the fact that we have these um, indigenous language communities, I think makes all of the um, government areas just that bit more language aware. So even making points around the non-indigenous languages, um, not that I did, but from previous experience, I think that they're just a little bit better at understanding um, or being more up to date on what's happening in, for example, classrooms and research. It's, I think it's also much easier, I should say, to access um, civil servants and stakeholders to talk about these issues than it is um, in, um, in England. Thank you, Michelle. I think reluctantly we'll have to we'll have to stop this um, part of, of um, our two part session. Um, I think this is first of all I'd like to reiterate our thanks on the on part of the whole of the community for the immense amount of work you've done, but also to um, to say that this is ongoing work and we will be coming back to this and referring to this and working with with funding bodies and it is very important for us to do that. So thank you very much indeed for all your work on that.